When the news broke that the BRICS group of countries would expand to 11 next year, it set alarm bells ringing in US-led political and economic institutions. For many developing nations, BRICS already represents an attractive alternative to a Western-led economic system, which gives America and her allies massive influence over the way the rest of the world trades and receives financial support. But with Argentina, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates set to join, BRICS is quickly evolving into a cross-continental behemoth that could dramatically shift the balance of power away from the West and bring about a new multipolar age. There's just one problem. What the f*** are we going to call it now? Okay, actually I think they're just going to say BRICS plus. But with that crisis averted, here's the other issue. As BRICS grows stronger, and the bloc's aspirations shift from economic cooperation to political shot calling, so too does its potential to collapse. In this video, we'll break down the ways in which the bloc could leverage its virtues to shatter the West's domination of global economies and politics, and we'll explore how a strong BRICS could prove hugely beneficial for developing nations. But we'll also take a look at some of the potential stumbling blocks that could well cause the group to implode. And at the end of the video, we will predict which way things are going to go. You ready? Let's get going. Let's first quickly recap the when and why of how BRICS was born. The acronym BRIC was originally coined in 2001 by Goldman Sachs banker Jim O'Neill, who predicted that Brazil, Russia, India and China would be the world's largest economies by 2050. In 2009, the wake of the global financial crisis, the leaders of these nations convened at the inaugural BRICS summit in Russia. The S was added when South Africa joined one year later. In its infancy, this loose grouping appeared to have little to no ambition to challenge US hegemony or undermine the Western-led political and economic foundations represented by the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund. The emerging countries were focused on national growth with the assistance of trade with the West, fostering economic cooperation, and aiming to leverage their massive markets, natural resources, and growing economic potential to boost commerce. In 2014, BRICS founded the New Development Bank to fund infrastructure projects in member countries and other emerging economies. And towards the end of the 2010s, the BRICS countries began capitalizing on their shared objectives and economic potential. Annual summits yielded improved communication, which in turn led to agreements on currency swaps to enhance financial stability and collaborative efforts in international forums like the G20. But the turbulent 2020s, caused by the COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and the crumbling of US-China relations, has triggered a metamorphosis. Amid an East-West divide unlike anything seen since the Cold War, BRICS quickly transformed from an economic development group into a vehicle for geopolitical leverage. But not everybody is happy about that, including some of its own members. There are many reasons why a more powerful BRICS could shatter Western political and economic dominance. As it stands, the five countries of BRICS already account for more than 40% of the world's population and about a third of its GDP. Those are massive assets in terms of human capital and purchasing power, and they exceed that of the G7. But if all six countries invited to join a last month's summit follow through, those numbers will increase dramatically, as will the bloc's control over one essential commodity, oil. Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Iran are all among the world's top 10 oil producers alongside Russia and Brazil, and China is the world's biggest oil importer. Bringing all these nations under one roof, so to speak, will massively enhance the bloc's control over the production, distribution and pricing of oil, and therefore its ability to exert significant leverage over Western economies that heavily rely on consistent and affordable access to energy resources. But there is another reason why Western countries, particularly America, are really concerned about the rise of BRICS. And it's all about the Benjamins. Since the mid-20th century, the global financial architecture has hinged on the supremacy of the US dollar as the world's primary reserve currency. This is a system which affords Washington countless advantages. Most commodities, including that sweet, sweet oil that we all love so much, are priced in dollars. The currency is always in such high demand that the US can always borrow at low interest rates. 
while other countries that borrow in dollars will face brutal repayment terms if the currency rises in value. This also means the White House can damage countries whose political and economic agendas it doesn't like by levying crippling sanctions. This power dynamic is further reinforced by the structure of the IMF, where voting power on policy decisions is tied to the size of the country's economies, effectively giving Washington the power to veto any decisions it doesn't like, while preventing other nations from pushing for reform. For these reasons, the US has long enjoyed an extremely privileged position in terms of dictating international financial transactions, trade terms, and tariff policies through diplomatic horse trading. It will come as no surprise then that many countries, particularly developing nations, and most of the global south, are absolutely sick and tired of it. BRICS, especially America's main foes, Russia and China, understand this all too well and are attempting to dilute the dollar's influence by making a collective push to use their own currencies in as many mutual transactions as possible. This helps to shield them from the vulnerabilities imposed by fluctuations in the dollar's value, reduces the impact to external control over their economies, and weakens the bite of American economic sanctions. And, as transactions become seamless, the potential for increased trade flows within BRICS will only grow, cementing its economic interdependence and collective bargaining power on the global stage. There has even been talk of BRICS creating a brand new shared currency, similar to the euro, that would allow members to break free from the dollar's tractor beam and offer dozens of developing countries a sought-after alternative financial avenue. This vision remains very much in its nascent stages and was not even on the agenda for discussion at BRICS's August summit. But a future of de-dollarization and establishing a more multipolar financial order is a realistic long-term aim for BRICS. In the meantime, BRICS's new development bank is a beacon of hope for developing countries seeking financial assistance and infrastructure development because it offers distinct advantages over Western-led institutions. First, it prioritizes infrastructure and energy development, a critical need for many developing countries. Second, it offers longer grace periods and lower interest rates compared to the World Bank and the IMF. And third, even more appealing for emerging economies, these loans are typically offered with no political strings attached, unlike loans that come from the IMF that come with restrictive caveats and conditions, where the money is only granted if policy requirements are followed. Now, the NDB already offers more than 20% of its loans to countries in their local currencies, and is aiming to push this number beyond 30% next year, according to its president. It all sounds very promising, but is it really feasible? Clearly, BRICS has great promise. In less than 15 years, it has evolved from a loose grouping of nations on the rise to an economic and political force equipped to empower developing nations and break the West's grip on the global economy. But before that dream can become reality, BRICS countries must navigate a series of obstacles, any one of which could significantly restrict its progress, or at worst, cause the organisation to crumble completely. Now, paradoxically, the biggest of BRICS's problems is also arguably the source of its greatest strength, diversity. BRICS members span four continents, and each bring something unique to the table. China has a powerful industry and manufacturing base. India has a growing youthful population and a skilled labor force. Brazil boasts incredible agricultural resources. Russia has huge hydrocarbons reserves and some scientific excellence. And South Africa is replete with mineral wealth. What's more, their geographical and cultural diversity provides a platform for these nations to collectively address global issues and form a counterweight to Western narratives. But as the role of BRICS grows from a non-aligned economic coalition into an instrument of political influence, their political differences and competing national interests are brought into sharp focus. Now, arguably the greatest source of discord is between China and India, who are locked in a long-standing border dispute that has significantly strained bilateral relations. The region of Aksai Chin and the northeastern Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh, which China refers to as South Tibet, have been the source of military standoffs and diplomatic deadlock for decades. Speaking earlier this year, India's foreign minister said that relations between India and China are not normal and cannot be normal until the border disputes are resolved, that making absurd claims does not make others' territories yours. Meanwhile, India in recent years has forged a close strategic partnership with the US, which is rapidly becoming China's chief antagonist. 
The pair cooperate very closely in technology research and manufacturing and are forming closer defence ties, so much so that the US is now India's largest trading partner. India is also taking a more prominent role in the Quad, which is basically a neighbourhood watch alliance keeping an eye on China in the Indo-Pacific. And New Delhi is also pushing to become the leader of developing nations in South and East Asia, and potentially the global South as a whole, which of course puts it in direct competition with Beijing. The point is, if two of BRICS's principal members can't get along, then the planned expansion is only going to introduce yet more complexities and internal conflicts. Take Saudi Arabia and Iran, for example, two of the major powers in Western Asia. Tentative steps were taken to bridge the Gulf across the Gulf in March. They restored diplomatic relations after seven years under a deal brokered by none other than China. But the ceremonial opening of embassies has had little meaningful impact in resolving decades of tensions between the Sunni Muslim monarchy and the Shia theocracy, particularly over the internationalized civil wars in Syria and Yemen, which have seen millions of people displaced and hundreds of thousands killed. And although Iran's relations with the UAE warmed a bit last year, Emirati policy towards Tehran is still very much geared towards containing Iranian influence in the region. This is evidenced by Abu Dhabi's close military cooperation with Riyadh. Now, conflicts like these pose a serious problem when you consider BRICS' decision-making process. The BRICS presidency operates on a rotation, shifting annually to reside with whichever country holds the group summit that year. Plus, any decisions made, actions taken or statements delivered by the group are only done so with unanimity. In other words, every country needs to agree on a course of action before it's taken. On the face of it, it's a remarkably democratic and egalitarian system, and quite ironic when you consider that seven of the 11 nations that will be part of BRICS next year are classified as not free societies by Freedom House. But reaching a consensus with five nations is already difficult. Adding another six into the mix will make it nigh on impossible and will dramatically reduce BRICS's decision-making efficacy. And this leads me to address the big red elephant in the room. BRICS presents itself as a united front in which all countries have an equal say in agenda setting and policy making. But it appears that China, and to a lesser extent Russia, are the ones leading BRICS's aggressive expansion and are the driving force behind any anti-Western tilt the bloc may take. The inclusion of Iran not only strengthens the contra-Western contingent of BRICS, but was only made possible after China spearheaded efforts to patch up relations between the Islamic Republic, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Now all of those countries can help secure China's energy needs. And why are Egypt and Ethiopia joining BRICS? ahead of a far more obvious candidate like Indonesia, or perhaps Nigeria. After all, the former is one of the world's major emerging economies, and the latter is Africa's largest and most populous. On the other hand, Egypt is facing a serious economic crisis, with its sovereign debt close to 100% of its GDP, and Ethiopia has been racked by a brutal civil war the past few years that has seen investments dry up and billions in funding frozen. You don't have to be a cynic to argue, that it's probably because Ethiopia is currently the second largest debtor to China in all of Africa, while Beijing is helping the Egyptian government to develop the Suez Canal Economic Zone as part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Meanwhile, Indonesian President Joko Widodo said he didn't want to rush into membership, a decision symbolic of Jakarta's foreign policy of non-alignment, but also its deepening defense ties with the US. Now, it must be said that South Africa's Cyril Ramaphosa India's Narendra Modi and Brazil's Lula da Silva have all officially voiced support for the expansion of BRICS and have all equally criticised the West's hold over the global economy. But as mentioned previously, Delhi and Brasilia have a strong strategic and economic tie to the US and EU and have no desire to be caught in the political crossfire between the West and China. And although South Africa has partnered more closely with Russia and China of late, hosting joint military and naval exercises for example, Ramaphosa will be reluctant to damage trade ties with Western countries behind closed doors. Ultimately, Beijing's seemingly outsized sway in BRICS means that sooner or later, other member nations may not be able to remain on the fence. With all this in mind, it's fair to say that BRICS now stands at a pretty pivotal crossroads. There's no doubt that the bloc has the potential to disrupt Western dominance, with its growing hold over essential commodities, a huge share of the world's GDP, and far-reaching geopolitical influence 
BRICS could well usher in a new economic paradigm in an emerging multipolar world, but the road ahead is fraught with difficulty. The competing political and economic interests of the member states and differing cultural values have already strained internal relations in the case of India and China and have highlighted how regional competition and internal disputes could derail cooperation. The inclusion of historically antagonistic nations like Saudi Arabia and Iran, or states that are more aligned with China, could sideline the interests of other BRICS members and plunge the group's model of consensus-based decision-making into deadlock. Ultimately, the success of BRICS in shaping a new multipolar world order will depend on its ability to navigate these challenges while maintaining unity among its diverse member nations. That is an extremely difficult balancing act to perform, and in my opinion, one that will prevent BRICS from making any real impact on the Western-led economic system, at least in the short term. But just before we wrap this up, there's one more point to consider. This whole video has focused on the power BRICS has to shape our political and economic futures. But what about the West? Imagine what would happen if the G7, the World Bank and the IMF were to actually address many of the criticisms they quite rightfully face. I think that if Western governments sought to cooperate with developing nations, to examine how the flawed economic system could be reformed, then a lot of the political leverage that BRICS is developing would be rendered completely moot. But does the West have the political will or moral purpose to address these inequalities? No, I don't think so.